this week's drive, we taste the black, black tarmac of home. Do some low-level flying in Mexico. See a one-off hybrid with new ideas. And play hide-and-seek or smoke. All this and more in this week's Drive. start with the A1 Grand Prix round in Mexico with David Martinez, born and bred near the Monterey track, looking forward to his hometown race. Well, that's actually great. I mean, we in a uh, Mexican team are used to traveling 30 hours, 40 hours on the plane to get 20 tracks. So the idea of being just a few blocks from home is refreshing. So uh, I think we have a big weight uh, on us this weekend and uh, hopefully we'll will end up uh, on the podium. Rain has played a part in recent A1 races and the first day of practice was no different. Japan's Hayanari Shimoda ended his first session early when he hit a tire wall. Martinez was another one who struggled on the wet track, only managing 17th and 16th in his two sessions. In his first A1 drive, Canada's Patrick Carpentier found the limits of grip, but he came a promising seventh in the first session. New Zealand's Matt Halliday was relishing the treacherous conditions. He went quickest in the first session, setting the fastest time of the day. Also going well was France's Alex Pramat. France lead the overall standings, and Pramat, who took over the car from Nicolas Lapierre, set the second quickest time of the day, a quarter of a second slower than Halliday, despite an unexpected detour. But no such problems for Halliday, who was delighted with his day's work. Yeah, it was very wet and uh, and quite dirty. You know, it was it was fun. You know, I think it's quite a good layout here. Uh, the circuit definitely is very slippery. Um, it's going to be very tough if it's wet for the weekend because you know you you struggle with vision. There's a lot of uh, dirt on the circuit. But no, it was a very uh, enjoyable day. Obviously, we're doing well. So looking forward to it. Third place in Britain is New Zealand's best finish so far this season. After the rain of practice, the umbrellas were out, but it was sunny in Monterey for Saturday's qualifying session. Making his debut in A1 for Lebanon was 17-year-old Graham Rahal, son of IndyCar legend Bobby. Rahal Sr. has always been proud of his Lebanese background, and Rahal Jr. claimed 16th place on the grid. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great honor to actually represent the country, and, uh, and we hope that it, uh, it gives, um, you know, that, that, that our results will um, make people proud in the Middle East and, and all around the world. After a poor showing from David Martinez, Salvador Duran, third in Indonesia, qualified the Mexican car. But Duran fared little better than his teammate, claiming only 14th on the grid. Another IndyCar star of more recent vintage, Brian Herter, put the USA's dismal season behind them to better their neighbors with fifth place on the day. Italy have also disappointed this season, but Enrico Toccacello put them into fourth place on the grid with a real chance of a podium finish. But there was to be a frantic end to qualifying to decide pole position. South Africa had led for most of the day, but series leader France took the lead with Pramat's final effort. France could clinch the title with 12 more points over Switzerland. Neil Yanni made it clear that France will have to fight hard to take the crown, slotting the Swiss team into second place. But with the flag out, South Africa's Stephen Simpson set the fastest lap for his first pole position. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it's really nice being surrounded by these two drivers, and I think I've got a, a quite a few more experienced drivers right behind me. So uh, I think, uh, well, I certainly want to uh, be on the podium and on the top step of the podium. and. Uh, I don't really have a, a championship to be uh, winning at the moment, so I'm going to go all out for the win. On race day, the home crowd was hoping for something special from Team Mexico driver Salvador Duran. There were plenty of French supporters in the crowd too, with Pramat needing to beat Switzerland's Neil Yarny to clinch the title with two rounds to spare. The lights went out, pole starter South Africa's Stephen Simpson was quickly reeled in and overhauled by Pramat on the first lap. Duran was forced to retire after a coming together with Ireland's Ralph Furman. That collision brought out the safety car, but as the field slowed down behind it, Japan's Shimoda flipped in spectacular fashion with debris showering the track. 
Shimoda was caught unawares as New Zealand's Matt Halliday braked in front of him and then catapulted into the air, with a car just stopping short of the official holding the safety car sign. Fortunately, Shimoda emerged unscathed, although he would miss the feature race later in the day. When racing resumed, France held on to its lead to take the chequered flag ahead of Switzerland, with Toccatello taking third for Italy and Jos Verstappen securing fourth for the Netherlands. The placings in the sprint race decided the grid positions for the feature race, and Kramat made another good start to lead the field through the first corner, with Verstappen passing Toccatello for third. The teams all made their mandatory pit stops early in the race and Pramat retained his lead with Yanni coming out after his pit stop just behind the French car. But Yanni, in his last A1 race before taking up his test driver duties for the Scuderia Toro Rosso Formula One team, would lose second place to fast-charging Dutchman Jos Verstappen. The safety car came out again after Indonesia's Ananda Mikola took out Australia's Christian Jones. Mikola limped back to the pits for a new nose, but Jones's race ended right there. Further up the field, the Czech Republic's Thomas Enger moved past New Zealander Halliday late in the race to win the battle for seventh place. But at the front, it was Pramat who proved dominant again to make it a perfect day for France, with Verstappen taking an excellent second place, just his second podium finish of the season. Jani took third for Switzerland, with Germany's Timo Scheider sneaking into fourth. Only a major mishap can deny them the title, but Pramat was content to reflect on a good day at the office. It was a fantastic race because uh, the car was uh, pretty good. Uh, we changed uh, a lot of things in, in the car. And uh, the car, it's, uh, it was uh, pretty, pretty good, and so I did uh, also the fastest lap, so this is nice. So, maximum points for the French team, who now go 32 points clear of Switzerland with just two rounds remaining. The series now heads north of the border with California's Laguna Seca Raceway hosting round 10. The California Speedway in Fontana played host to NASCAR's Auto Club 500, with the cars aiming to complete 250 laps of the two-mile oval track. The race got off to a clean start, and there were only a few caution flags all day, with no major accidents. Last year's runner-up Greg Biffle led for much of the day at one point by 13 seconds, an eternity in NASCAR. But his day ended when his engine failed just 25 laps from the finish. Also on lap 225, there was nearly a major pile-up. JJ Yelly tapped and spun the number two car of pole starter Kurt Busch. Busch's car set up a cloud of smoke as it veered towards the infield, but amazingly the rest of the field managed to avoid it. Now we'll see it. The slow motion replay showed just how close he came to being collected by the number 29 car driven by Kevin Harvick. After a late caution flag for debris, the race restarted on lap 250 with Matt Kenseth in front. But officials extended the race by two laps so it wouldn't end at reduced speed under yellow flags, setting up a two-lap sprint to the finish. Daytona 500 winner and series leader Jimmy Johnson tried to pass Kenseth on the outside of the first turn, but the leader held him off and pulled away to win by five car lengths. 2003 champion Kenseth started 31st on the grid but carved through the field to record his 11th career win, but only the second in his last 72 races. He only led for 40 laps, including the final 33, giving Ford a first win with their new Fusion model. Dick Berger in amidst the spray of victory. World Superbikes had a strong Australian contingent turned out for qualifying at Phillip Island. And it proved to be a good day for them. Brazilian Alex Barros was one of only two non-Australians in the top five at the end of qualifying, finishing fifth fastest. One of the performances of the day came from unheralded Australian Steve Martin. Despite piloting an underpowered foggy Patronus, Martin exploited his local knowledge and upstaged some of his better-known rivals to claim fourth on the grid. Just ahead of Martin was Britain's James Tosland, champion two years ago, who had a miserable time last season with injuries and breakdowns. He set the third fastest time for a place on the front row of the grid. Qualifying, though, was ultimately about the two Troys, Bayless and Corsa, 
the two Australians went head to head, the pair returning the two fastest times in Super Bowl. Corsa, the reigning world champ, laid down a marker with a quick time and he must have thought that that would be enough to secure pole position. But Bayless is a tough competitor. The 36-year-old, who has returned to superbikes after three years in MotoGP, earlier set the best time ever on a superbike on the 4.45km circuit in free practice. He then went past Corsa's effort to secure his second consecutive pole position, following his impressive performance in Qatar. He also made sure that there would be three Australians in the top four on the grid, and then dismissed his own achievements as messy. Yeah, well, you know, we come back home to a home race and you've got to try and enjoy yourself. Of course, it's busy for us guys, uh, family and friends and, and lots of fans, but, you know, that's, that's how it is. And uh, everything's going well today. My lap was good enough to take pole, but honestly, I thought I was going to do a little bit better. That was a little bit messy. I had my feet in the wrong place in a few spots, but, yeah, I'm happy. It's going to be a hard day tomorrow for sure, but uh, I'm sure we're going to get another nice day. The entire event was expected to be a straight battle between the two Troys, but the first race of the day went all one way. Bayless used his early advantage to set a storming pace in the opening race, but excessive tyre wear on his Ducati slowed him down. Italian Vittorio Iannuzzi crashed unhurt on lap 11. He was followed by British youngster Craig Jones two laps later. Rear tyre wear in the final stages dropped Bayless down to sixth. Corsa sized up his opponent, going past him easily, with Brazil's Alex Barros following suit a few seconds later on his Honda. That left Corsa and Barros to fight it out for victory, but the Australian was always going to be too quick for the Brazilian, and the defending world champion crossed the line comfortably ahead of MotoGP refugee Barros. Britain's James Toseland followed in third place to maintain his challenge in the world championship and put two Hondas on the podium with Corsa's Suzuki. The double world champion clearly back in the devastating form, which saw him cruise to the title last year. We now have the, the day's second race was much more eventful. Bayless, having dominated qualifying and set another new track record in the morning warm-up, was determined to make amends for his earlier lack of results. Yamaha rider Noriyuki Haga was the early leader, but first Tosland and then Bayless slipped past the Yamaha. The excitement was caused by Corsa. He crashed out of the race on lap four when he high-sided at MG Corner, fell off his bike and landed right in the middle of the track. Unfortunately, Corsa was clipped by Barros, who had only a split second to avoid the prone rider. Luckily, Corsa suffered only bruising and some pain in his left side. Carl Muggeridge and Lorenzo Lanzi crashed uninjured on the 11th lap. It looked like Tosland and his new Honda were going to take the top spot, but on lap 15, Bayless got past and started to pull away and built a lead over the Briton. Behind them, Barros, Hager and yet another Australian, Andrew Pitt, were battling for third place. At the end of the race, Bayless was over five and a half seconds clear of Tosland, with Barros finishing third. 14 seconds behind the race winner. Japan's Haga took another fourth place for Yamaha. For Bayless, it was a 23rd World Superbike victory and Ducati's first of the season, following the two second places achieved by Bayless in Qatar at the season's opening round. The results from Phillip Island sees Bayless on top of the World Championship standings on 75 points, just one point ahead of Tosland. Despite his crash, Corsa is third on 63. The next round of the championship will be held in Valencia in Spain in late April. BMW has shown its take on hybrid technology with the X3 Efficient Dynamics. Using new innovations such as SuperCap technology, active transmission, automatic engine startup, high precision injection and brake energy regeneration, the concept X3 Efficient Dynamic achieves an increase in performance while improving on the fuel consumption by up to 20% over the standard X3. In contrast to the petrol-electric hybrid vehicles from Toyota, Honda and Ford, the X3 uses high-performance capacitors, or supercaps, to store and supply electric energy to the vehicle's well-packaged active transmission. 
The active transmission combines an 80 kilowatt electric motor with a conventional six-speed automatic gearbox and attaches to a BMW straight-six engine that uses jet-guided direct injection to further increase efficiency. The X3 concept combines BMW's valve tronic throttle with high-precision injection technology, the first jet-guided direct fuel injection system for large-scale production. High-precision injection technology is likely to follow Valvetronic into full-scale production within the next few years. Whenever the driver applies the brakes and slows to a stop, the petrol engine switches off, eliminating fuel consumption and emissions. At the same time, the electric motor becomes an alternator, recharging the battery. When the accelerator is pressed, the engine restarts automatically. If the driver continues to accelerate, the 400 newton meter electric motor delivers a maximum output of 82 brake horsepower. Under moderate acceleration, the X3 hybrid uses only the electric motor to minimize consumption and emissions. At maximum acceleration, the output of the electric motor and the combustion engine combine to deliver up to 600 newton meters of torque, but at engine speeds below 1,500 RPM. When not powering the car, the electric motor automatically converts to an alternator again to recharge the system. Power storage and supply is performed by innovative double-layer capacitors, the supercaps, in the vehicle's sills, offering over 10 times more capacity per kilogram than conventional nickel-metal hydride batteries. The supercaps have a total capacity of 190 kilowatts, more than enough for the car to be driven quickly. BMW chairman Dr. Helmut Panker noted that while this vehicle won't go into production in this form, it does provide a preview of possible future developments. Make that probable, since BMW announced late in 2005 that it was joining forces with General Motors and Daimler Chrysler to develop hybrids, a collaboration expected to bear product fruit in 2008. BMW are quick to avoid any commitment to solo hybrid research, vaguely offering that the BMW Group is keeping other options open for the rapid development of other drive technologies through appropriate cooperation and joint ventures. If BMW were to put the X3 hybrid into production, it would be cool, but probably horribly unsafe, to retain the iDriver hybrid side sills, which show off the coppery red supercaps themselves. Rain has affected much of the pre-season testing allowed for MotoGP riders, and it happened again at Barcelona's Circuit de Catalunya. All the teams were in attendance and a new BMW sports car would go to the quickest rider in the final 40-minute session. Nicky Hayden has impressed during pre-season and he went well again here despite the wet conditions. The works Honda rider, who will be looking to add to his one career Grand Prix win from last season, went top of the lap sheets with a time of 1 minute 58.9 seconds. Also having a good day was Britain's James Ellison, who was only 7 tenths of a second slower than the American on his Yamaha. It was to be a frustrating session for five times MotoGP world champion Valentino Rossi. Having been quickest in the dry on the previous two days, the Italian could only manage third place ahead of Ellison and suffered the embarrassment of a trip into the gravel. No such problems for Rossi's teammate Colin Edwards. Near the end of the session, he clocked a time 1.8 seconds quicker than fellow American Hayden to take top spot. The former Superbike world champion from Texas has yet to win a Grand Prix, but it can't be far off. And Edwards was delighted to pick up the keys to a 252 kilowatt BMW Z4 M Roadster. Another BMW Z4 M Coupe will go to the MotoGP rider with the fastest qualifying time at the last world championship in Valencia in Spain on October the 29th. Yeah, I mean, the conditions, as you can see, are terrible, but <coughs> my, I had a bit of a cough. I hadn't been feeling that great, but the test has been going good, and we came here today and thought, oh, God, it's raining. Let's see what happens and see who's keen. And uh, funny enough, right before we started the session, I thought, well, I got a pretty good feeling about this. So we went out in Michelin, thanks to Michelin. They stepped up and uh, got some good stuff. And my whole team, Yamaha, everybody, Camel, they've been working really hard. And, starting to pay off. <laughs> the season starts with the Spanish Grand Prix at Jerez. The Indoor Trials World Championship moved on to Lisbon in Portugal for the ninth round of the season. Spain's Hironi Fajardo finished sixth, just behind British veteran Dougie Lampkin. 
Tony Bowe was fourth, which consolidated third place in the championship for the talented young Spaniard. The final round saw Takahisa Fujinami, Adam Raga and Albert Kabastani battle for the podium places. Fujinami eventually finished third, the Japanese Montessa rider paying the price for picking up the maximum five penalties in the waterfall, the penultimate section of the event. That left Adam Raga and fellow Spaniard Albert Capistani, first and second respectively in the championship standings, competing for the win in Portugal. Raga was leading after the third section with only one penalty point to his name compared to the five apiece for Capistani and Fujinami. But the reigning indoor and outdoor world champion suffered failures on sections six and eight on his gas gas. That allowed Cabastani a sight of victory, and the Shoko rider made the most of his opportunity. A total of 13 penalty points, two less than Raga, saw Cabastani top the podium. So, Raga's overall championship lead is now down to 15 points. Raga has 80 points and Capistani 65, with Tony Bow third on 55. Three rounds remain in the indoor season, with the next event taking place in Sao Paulo in Brazil. The Night of the Jumps Championship ran over two nights of competition. Adam Jones won the first day, but it was all to play for on day two as fans, both young and old, filled the stadium. Nine riders from three continents did battle on a stony dirt course that had already eliminated American Mike Mason. He crashed heavily in practice and was unable to participate. That meant that there was one less rider standing between Mathieu Rabot and victory. The reigning Knight of the Jumps champion was seeking his second win from his season's five rounds to date. Rabot finished as runner-up to Jones on Friday after topping the qualification round standings. The Swiss rider could only manage third place in Saturday's qualifying round, but his excellent performance in the six-man final would take some beating. Rabot received 331 points for a run that included a backflip can-can with one-handed landing. A fifth-place finish in Friday's final suggested that Ronnie Renner could be in with a chance with victory on Saturday. The American finished in second place in qualifying, and his final run had all the hallmarks of a triumphant performance. But Renner would have to settle for second place overall with a score of 314 points. Consolation for Renner would come in the whip and highest air contests, which he would win ahead of Rabot and Libor Podmol of the Czech Republic, respectively. Third place went to Andre Villa. The Norwegian was expected to win in Innsbruck after leading in qualifying. But Villa's hopes fell to the ground with his Yamaha when he failed to land one of his jumps on the unforgiving course, handing Rabot his second win of the season. Yeah, I'm uh, so happy. My run in the final, everything is uh, perfect. Uh, I did all my tricks and uh, it's very good. I'm so surprised. I make my, for my first time the backflip can can to uh, one and landing, and uh, it's pretty cool. I hope so. All the events for the, the next week is the same. Rabot has finished on the podium in four of the season's five events to date, with the second and third place finishes to go with his pair of victories. So whether you're spinning through 360 degrees in the rain or falling on your side in the gravel, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.